Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie was an esteemed woman with entirely too many first names. Being a woman who has published some 60 plus of the most influential mystery novels and whodunit thrillers of all time. Even known to cause a mystery once or twice herself. Ryan Craig Johnson was a youngster that enjoyed all the live action versions of many of these films. Miss Marple caught his eye for a spell, but it was Sidney Lumet's 1974 masterpiece, Murder on the Orient Express, with its all star cast that had a particular effect on young Ryan. Knives Out is a masterwork created by some of the finest artists in front of and behind the camera working today. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of, uh, line. What, what was his film boy, Michael, was that? Knives Out is a 2019 whodunit thriller written and directed by Ryan Johnson. The cast of this film is out of this world. Thank you. That means a lot. Somehow jockeying with each other to see who can pin the thickest slice of ham to the wall. Even Frank Oz shows up a few times. Go watch it right now if you haven't seen it. It'll make your life better for, you know, roughly two hours. A quick note, if you still need convincing, I will be reserving parts two and three of this essay for spoilers and the meat and potatoes of the plot and structure while spending part one just trying to get you to watch this banger of a murder mystery. Luckily, there's a lot to go over just in how this film was made, like Wagyu beef stroganoff or something. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write that down. Wagyu beef stroganoff. A good a place as any to start with non-spoiler Wagyu stroganoff is the cinematography in this film by Steve Yedlin, who was previously responsible for the throne room scene and all of Ryan Johnson's other movies starting with Brick. And of course, in 2015, released the quintessential color science banger display prep demo where Steve finds himself around LA on an Ari Alexa digital movie camera and a 35 millimeter film camera, does an absolute boatload of thoughtful design and you know, f math, then puts the results side by side to prove there can be no experiential difference between the two. Press F to pay your respects to Christopher Nolan. Steve is agreeing that filmmakers are right to want to preserve the imperfections of a film camera, uh, example like gate weave or luminance value. He then replicates those values algorithmically like a stone cold D-O-double-G. <laughs> Sorry, I'm eating weeds all over the place here. New approach. Steve Yedlin is a genius. End of sentence. <laughs> Steve Yedlin is a genius who is arguing that not only can you absolutely replicate the experience of using a film camera with a digital pipeline, the digital experience also comes with all the benefits of shooting digitally. For example, shooting on film requires a absolute metric ton of light, whereas digital, not so much. So Knives Out doesn't really look like any film I've ever seen. It is almost entrancingly wonderful to just look at. Bonus second example, shooting on film makes hot light sources like broad daylight through a window get a vibrant little glow around them because hot light will impact celluloid film stock differently than a digital sensor. This is called halation. It's a pleasing effect of working with film. Steve just wrote a, a pipeline script to do it. So I mean to say, 
Steve Yedlin is not just a camera nerd, he's THE camera nerd, which is layer one of why this film is so much more than meets the eye, so let's go one deeper. Look at this cast. Look, look at them. Embrace them. Daniel Craig, Edward Armas, Jamie Lee Curtis, Don Johnson, Chris Evans, Lakeith Stanfield, Tony Collette, Michael Shannon, Christopher Plummer, Frank Oz, <gasps> all doing their absolute best Agatha Christie scenery galactusing, which Agatha Mary Clarissa for first names Christie is still also doing in the cinema. My name is Hercule Poirot. And I'm probably the greatest detective in the world. The truth is that Agatha Christie movies have always done this. Starring the greatest cast of suspicious characters ever involved in murder. I am going to talk a lot more in the next section about the acting in this movie. Knives Out is an acting clinic. Their performances are part of the entire puzzle, and all of it is a joy to experience. Daniel Craig. And yes, you are right. None of these weak alibis and domestic squibbles answer your question. Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. Our donut is not whole at all. Yarn. More correctly, this yarn. Ryan Johnson movies have always been clever. People definitely have larger than normal emotional reactions to Ryan's films than other movies, but they're clever. The Last Jedi was a Star Wars movie deconstructed through the lens of a Star Wars movie. <laughs> This is all I hear right now. There are simply not enough mega cast murder mystery movies out there. It's a brilliant script that cooks on high for an hour and a half. And Jamie Lee Curtis is like, wah, a lot, and it's adorable and incredible. Also, you should watch this movie so you can watch my next two parts. They're real, they're really good. So obviously from here, many spoilers as I'm gonna dissect and extrapolate, you know, the, the, everything. Automatons, things designed to appear and mimic what it is to be human but are woefully little more than mechanical decorations. And also uh, very creepy. Harlan Thrombey, the world famous and unseemly rich mystery author, collects these art pieces in his giant nightmare house. Well, collected. And while simultaneously a beautiful dunk on his own spiteful mechanical baby children, it is also a full-throated reference to 1972's Sleuth. Think of the perfect crime. A Ryan Johnson favorite in a film about an eccentric mystery author who lives in a house of puzzles and automata where a, a, a murder happens. Oh yeah, when you, when you say it out loud, I, th I think I get the reference. Knives Out celebrates all of it, the murder mystery film and book genre as a whole. They joke on the commentary track that this is a movie about the world's worst criminal of all time versus the world's worst detective, because Marta pulled off a lot of subterfuge without Blanc noticing, but Blanc did notice. He literally notices the blood on Marta's shoe the moment he meets her. I've been doing a little poking. You're hired on a part-time basis. You have a movie where the greatest detective in the world is examining the scene of a subtle situation where a caretaker saved a man's life but thinks she ended it. It appears to be one thing, but then it isn't. He's not here, Harlan. But it is. This level of genre head fake in Hollywood is entirely welcome. Infer my meaning in as many ways as you can here, but it's all automata. The whole movie hinges on this one scene where you find out what happened at the close of Act 1. We are cheering for Marta. Hercule Poirot, this is not. The movie pivots on this dramatic, deeply unsettling scene where Marta believes she injected her patient with a... Sorry to use the proper medical term here. Uh, a metric ass boat of morphine. Okay. All emotions from the involved parties are real, probably the one scene where the characters tell the truth to each other. 
these two people that care about each other very much have to face some tragic facts. Harlan writes down his own murder because he thinks it's a good idea for a book later. At the close of Act 1, the game is not afoot. It's just sad and affecting. Okay, wait. Allow me to define this in a different way. Automatons are generally creepy, vaguely human-like dolls that perform the same pre-programmed actions over and over again. Without the controller of the house, they are lost, unable to live life as they once did. They are all searching for... A king's ransom. Ah! I have talked in this episode already about the mountains that Steve Yedlin has been moving for years in Hollywood. Everyone working on this film is performing at that level. The acting, as previously stated, is out of this world. There are so many little touches to flesh out the characters on rewatch. Think about what all of these characters know and when they know it. All of Harlan's kids claim to be self-made overachievers and one by one they begrudgingly reveal that that isn't true. Project strength, hide weakness. That's the thrombie way. The performative outrage. One of us killed him. One of his no, family no, walls, walls, killed him. No, Is that no. what you're suggesting, Lieutenant? This movie has a third eye laser focus on making sure you understand the emotions of any character in any context. Like that moment that Ransom realizes he already got away with it. Huh. And if you think I am dumb enough to be baited into talking family business, into sh Literally two seconds earlier. I mean, Walt, well, he's done well with what Dad gave him. Really, Dad hands him a book twice a year and Walt publishes it. The set design, the sound design, the acting, the writing, the cinematography, the editing. I love a tight little movie with big things to say, executed on this level. Chris Evans' post-Captain America return to playing assholes, a favorite pastime. Eat shit. Think about how many characters have to be highlighted in a cramped space for a two hour runtime. The framing of the image has layers, generally spotlighting a single character against many, but they are all engaged in the same scene. Harlan's painting in the landing shares frames with other people. I also, I love that the painting explicitly changes from angry eyes to a smile when Marta rightfully takes her place as Harlan's sole heir. Entitlement's a hell of a drug. Maybe I'm just saying that this is one of those movies that rewards the audience for paying too much attention to all the little details. Every phone and every clock in this entire movie is set to the correct time so that you can keep track of events. It's bananas. There is a mountain of thought put into this movie and it rewards the audience for digging deeper. A case with a hole in the middle. It's about the craft beyond the surprise. This is our reality, the status quo screaming to keep things just the way they are. The microaggressions, the pandering, the barely concealed rage. Immigrants, we get the job done. Ah! Ah! Oh, <clears throat> Sorry. The events of this very silly movie are in service of a literal, radical redistribution of wealth from a self-made empire to a caretaker with an undocumented parent. Subtle, this, uh, isn't. Marta has a whole lot on her plate. I mean, before the whole, whoops, I switched the bottles, but actually I didn't, but it still killed my friend, uh, thing. Which is probably the best dedication you could make to the genre on behalf of Agatha Christie. By the 1960s, she herself was disavowing her own characters. What did you know? She thought Hercule Poirot was a self-absorbed ego jockey. Hercule was the most police. He judged everybody so harshly that no one was good enough. Except for David Suchet's Hercule Poirot, he's, he's a good boy, you, you're, you can stay. I think it's a huge deal that Benoit Blanc mostly solves the case, at least understands what the important piece of it is on the first day and realizes that solving the case isn't synonymous with doing the right thing. 
It is an immovable fact that I killed Harlan. Yes, you did. Yes, he did. Yes, you are. But, but, a donut hole in a donut's hole. Knives Out is the movie where Hercule Poirot finally wasn't a dick about it. And they said all of that while simultaneously making one of the most immensely entertaining movie-watching experiences of the 2010s. Before the decade where the, we couldn't do that anymore. Wait, hang on. How are you supposed to segue out of that? Our donut is not whole at all. The whole picture, Ransom switched Harlan's vials and tried to hide it, thereby having to do a murder to cover it up. He's responsible for one death and carried out a second, the missing piece. When you watch this movie for the first time, it sticks with you in a way that movies don't necessarily often do. And I think it's kind of important to keep in mind that Ransom was not the only person removed from Harlan's will. All of Harlan's family was removed from his will. Hugh simply found out first and had the opportunity to do something about it. When I think about Knives Out, what comes to mind was not that Ransom did it, it's that any one of Harlan's family could have committed these crimes. If they'd been the one to find out. They all have motive, they're all prone to outbursts of anger when they don't get their way. The Thromby clan. Knives out, beaks bloody! You're a pack of vultures at the feast! You know, I don't fear death, but oh god, I'd like to fix some of this before I go. Harlan's death is tragic. He was going to be fine. Marta had saved him despite Ransom's meddling, but short that missing piece of the donut, he gave his life to save hers, or so he thought. Pay attention now. Your mom is still undocumented. She'll be found out and at best deported, and your family will be broken. But we're not going to let that happen, are we? Huh? Very Shakespearean, all of this. The oops, oh no, death. But really the beating heart of this movie from Marta to Benoit to Harlan himself, God rest him, is empathy. Marta realizes the mess she's making, not aware of the reality of the larger situation at all, and turns herself in. Marta was following what Harlan assured her was the way to handle this, and she's willing to renounce the entire inheritance to do the right thing. It's Benoit that tells all these bougie diaper commandos to stuff it. You have not been good to her. You have all treated her like shit. Maybe in some weird cosmic way, we're all Alan's assistant, falling asleep when the Thrombies talk in circles for hours to Alan about how Harlan could not have intended for this to happen, that his entire empire belongs to them, not Marta. An assistant played by Carrie Francis who manages to steal scenes from Jamie Lee Curtis and Frank Oz. So, uh... Turn down for what? And everyone in this movie is great, they're fantastic, but in some ways it all comes back to Harlan. He has clearly been trying to get through to his family about hard work and earning their own place in the world for years. He loves his family enough to say no. There's a lot of layers in this movie beyond just the surprise. For a big whodunit, it's amazingly rewatchable, revealing new layers of itself each time you watch it, and supplying clickbait videos with arrows on their thumbnails for years to come. A film that plays in the sandbox that Agatha Christie and many, many others played and invented in for years and years. A beautiful homage that stands on its own two feet. Knives Out, a film for anyone with four first names. Did I write that down wrong? Oh, and the whole movie functions like a hot sweater catalog, so it also has that going. I have made that layer eight sweaters, layer, layer eight sweaters. Oh, I'm out of time, all. <laughs> Hello, thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. Uh, special shout out to all these cool names and the pretzels here on our Patreon, patreon.com slash movies and Mikey. It supports everything we do at Filmjoy, just like Christopher Wu and Braden Jared and Andy Bates and Matt Buffano and that should have been something, the title of my memoir. Uh, check out our new show, youtube.com slash hotquest. It's a D&D &D show, me and the cast of Deep Dive. 
shot during quarantine. There's only four episodes, three of them are up right now. YouTube.com slash hot quest. Tracy Jones, Mike Laidlaw, Bednar. Pecano bananas? I, man, my pronunciation's bad. Walrus, Adam Muto, Kevin Hochter, Sarah Meaden, Andrew Hacker, Brett Brizzy, Brad LeClerc, Lord Hosk, Jacob Koziol. Like and subscribe.